I believe you're happiest, not when you're watching TV. You're not happiest when you're playing with your apps. You're not happiest when you're looking for likes. You're not happiest when you're fooling around. You're happiest when you're growing. I think we're hardwired. That it's a survival mechanism. We're happiest when we're making progress. So we have a deep fear of self-betrayal. And when we, when we don't capitalize on our talents, what starts to happen is that, what starts to happen is that we start to lose energy, we lose creativity, and we lose productivity. I believe that Many of us, the reason we don't have energy, the reason why we're not as creative as we want, the reason why we're not as productive as we want, is because we have betrayed our talent and the deep, wise, primal hero within knows of that self-betrayal and we start to hate ourselves. Is that an interesting point, show of hands? The place of knowing within you knows that you've betrayed your talents and we start to hate ourselves. And so we have a deep well of self-loathing inside of us that actually minimizes the four interior empires. And the four interior empires are the gateway into the exterior empires of creativity, productivity, performance, prosperity, lifestyle, and impact. How do you get to creativity, pro productivity, prosperity, performance, lifestyle, and impact through the four interior empires. Mindset, heart set, health set, and soul set. So that first fear is important. Second fear, fear of standing out. Well, how are you going to innovate if you haven't worked through your fear? This is why personal mastery is the gateway into, it's the gateway, it's the gateway drug into world class. If you're not happy right now, it's probably because you're not growing. Humans want to grow. We want to learn. We want to improve. We want to get better. We want to feel like we're making meaningful progress somewhere. And when we feel like we're learning and growing and the work that we do matters, we feel great, right? Have you felt great when you learned a new skill, when you, when you helped somebody out, when you felt that the work you were doing was meaningful? It felt amazing. But if you have too many days in a row where you feel like it's too hard, it's too big, you're not growing, you're not learning, there's, there's no hope, that leads down a really dangerous and negative path, not where we want to be. And part of why we become entrepreneurs is because we want to grow, right? Because we don't want to have a crappy, boring job working for somebody else, wasting our talents away. I remember my, my I didn't have that many jobs, but I had a landscaping job, which was super boring, just every day, just rolling out grass. And then I had a data entry job where this really turned me off of the corporate world where I was doing the work of, we had six people, five people on my team, and I was doing more work than all of the others combined. And I didn't take lunch breaks, I just, I just kept working. And my boss wasn't happy that because I was um, overhead lighting, gave me headaches, I used to have to bring in some snacks like food or popcorn or carrots or something so I didn't get crazy headaches and my boss didn't like that I was eating uh, a snack while I was working and I got into trouble and almost got fired even though I was doing more work than my entire team combined and it just really turned me off of the corporate world to realize hey this is this doesn't make any sense I wasn't growing you know I wasn't learning I wasn't improving. And so you can examine your own life. If you feel like you're in a rut, chances are you haven't learned anything recently. And so we can, we can plan for this. You, know, you can change your schedule so that you can focus on learning. You can put it into your daily calendar. And this is where I think it becomes the, the greatest benefit, my greatest tactic or strategy for you, for myself, is schedule in learning, schedule in growing. So for me, it's my own videos. You know, I make these videos, hopefully for you, that you learn and improve and something sparks for you, but I make them for me. I make them for me because I need it. Because I need to be around people who are doing big things. And that I know that every day there's a video for me. 
you know? <laughs> it's, it's gonna be positive, it's gonna be uplifting, it's gonna spread belief, it's gonna be motivational or inspiring, it's gonna be tactical, and I know that on my channel, I'm gonna get content that I want. And so I've hired a whole team and built a whole business basically around making content that I wanna watch. And thankfully enough of you guys wanna watch it as well that it, it, I can build a business and have a team. But if I didn't or nobody else cared about it, I would still do it for me. You know, it may not be as fancy, it may not have as much intros and all that stuff, but I would still have it for me because I need it. And so, we tend to catch these things too late because it's not part of our habits and routines. So if you notice you go to an event or you watch a video and you get all inspired and you're, you got energy and you're working and things are amazing, cool. And then have weeks or months gone by and you realize, uh, what happened to me? What, how, how did I fall off the horse so quickly? What, where did my energy go? Has that happened to you? Chances are it's because it wasn't scheduled, you know? Part of the entrepreneur roller coaster is because we're, we're bouncing from one high to the next without having any scheduled in learning and growth. And so my challenge to you would be to try to figure out how can we schedule in learning and growing every day? And so it starts with figuring out, okay, what medium do you like the most? You know, for me, I like videos. I like being able to see stuff. It just makes it so much easier for me. I'm a visual learner. Before YouTube was a thing, I learned from books. That was the best thing available at the time. Now, I still have a habit of reading 10 pages at least a night, but I, I don't get most of my learning from books. I get most of my learning from videos. But for you, maybe it's videos, if you're watching this, maybe it's books, maybe it's podcasts, something. Like, where do you get the best learning? And then the great thing about where we are right now is there's so much content, there's so many people to learn from, there's so many people creating things out there that you can go and learn from them. You know, if I, I look at an Eric Thomas or an Oprah Winfrey, they have a similar message, just a different delivery style. And so whatever you want to learn, chances are somebody's already making content on it. And so just go and find them. And think about who you're following right now. Like do an audit of who you follow right now. Who you're following on YouTube, who you're following on Instagram or TikTok or what podcast you listen to or what books are you picking up. And how many of those people that you're following or subscribed to actually make you feel ambitious and hopeful and better about yourself and give you strategies and light you up and feel like you're learning and growing, right? That's the whole point of this. We're trying to make growing and learning a consistent habit. So how many people that you're following actually make you want to learn and grow? And how many of them are you just mindlessly scrolling through? You know, when you load your Instagram or your YouTube and you're just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and two hours have gone by and not only have you not learned anything, you feel worse about your life because now you haven't been productive. You know, you've just kind of mindlessly entertained yourself, but it wasn't even that entertaining. You're like, what just happened to the past two hours of my life? Has that happened to you? Cool, unfollow those people. It's not that they're bad people, just that content doesn't light you up. And then start to be around the people who do. And the easiest way is through content. So if it's my channel, hey, good news, we got content every single day for you. <laughs> You'll never run out of Evan Carmichael content to watch. But it could be somebody else, it's somebody else in marketing or business or entrepreneurship or personal development or whatever category you're in to subscribe to those people and be around them as much as possible and watch their videos every day, schedule it in. For me, I go for a walk every morning, call it my Believe Walk. I just like getting some sun on my face and fresh air and getting out of the home and it just gives me some perspective and a little bit of motion and helps me set up my day. And then I'll, I'll have a video going from my channel. And um, every morning will be somebody else. It'll be Elon Musk or Oprah Winfrey or Mel Robbins or Tony Robbins or Gary Vee or Tom Billy or whatever. And that's what we do is pull the best clips that I would learn from and then we share it with everybody else. But that's a part of my daily routine. And I've, I've seen my own growth and development and learning and bravery and courage and momentum and consistency be directly contributed and correlated to the content that I'm consuming daily. And so step one is to unfollow and unsubscribe from the people who just make you waste time, feel worse about yourself, get envy, or just mindlessly tune out. And step two then is to figure out, I need to make learning, you need to make learning, growing, 
a part of your daily habit. And so where in your calendar can that fit? If it's over breakfast, if it's a morning walk, if it's a afternoon lunch, like where in your calendar can you put learning from your preferred style, video, podcast, books, etc. learning into your daily calendar. If you did that, your life will change. If you did that every day for the next year, every day, if you did that, if you scheduled that in and you actually did it, and you, you watched a video, read a book, or listen to a podcast that inspired you, said, you know what, I can do this, I can do more, I can be more, I can accomplish this, I gotta stop thinking small and stop doubting myself and stop telling myself that I suck and I can't do it. I can do this, like if you felt that energy, every day from watching a piece of content that you intentionally put into your habits and routine, every day for the next year, your life will totally transform. You will be a, a totally different person, which then allows you to serve more, to help more, to make more money, to guide more, to be a leader more, all of it, all of your ambitions and dreams and everything that you want is all possible. But you have to factor learning and growing into your daily consistent habits and routine. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Soul set is nothing mystical and it's nothing religious. Soul set is about saying, I am going to turn down the voice of my ego through my deep inner work so that the primal hero and highest part of me runs my life. Soul set is about saying, life is short. Before I know it, no matter how long I live, I'm going to be dust. How can I serve as many people as possible? Soul set is about finding a cause that is bigger than your life that you're going to donate the rest of your life to. I, I suggest to you, when you calibrate your soul set, you become a force of nature on the planet that becomes undefeatable. And yet people don't really focus on soul set. For the past number of years, I've been reading obituaries. And you might say, Robin, that's negative, and I don't think it's negative, I think it's really positive. Because I think few things are as powerful to wake you up, to remind you about what's most important, to fuel your energy, to get you into the game so you let go of your fears and you do what you need to do to get big things done than connecting to your own mortality. When you realize that every single day could be your last, or when you appreciate that no matter how long you live, life is a short ride, you just sort of let go of the fears and you let go of the limits and you live full on and you seize opportunities and you have real conversations with real people and you sort of wear your heart on your sleeve and you bring on the fullness of your authenticity and you do whatever it takes to get your loftiest dreams to get done. And so I read these obituaries and it reminds me about what life is all about. And relatively recently, I've started walking in cemeteries. I was in Mauritius a little while ago. It's, uh, I don't know if you've been to Mauritius, but it's this paradise on earth. It's this tiny island about four hours off the coast of Cape Town. And I've been to Mauritius a number of times. I was there to give a big leadership event. You know, I talk about leading without a title. So it was filled with um, iconic CEOs and people running big industries and big companies and entrepreneurs and startup um, uh, people. And it was really wonderful. But I also took about a week and a half just to refuel and to work on my new book and to reconnect with my values and to set myself up for the coming months. And one of the things I did was I went for a long walk. I love walking, I find interesting, like I find a lot of the most creative people and most productive people in the planet, they all have one thing in common, they have the routine of walking on a regular basis. And so I love walking. I've walked in nature for many, many years. And so here I am in Mauritius and I just started walking. And I was actually listening to uh, an interview of Charlie Rose and Steve Martin. And it was done in New York in front of an audience of a few thousand people. And it was about an hour and a half long. 
And Steve Martin was talking about his career, and Charlie Rose is one of the great interviewers of our time. So he was asking about how he became so good at what he did, and his life, and his love of art, and stand-up comedy, and acting. I mean, he, you know, Steve Martin became an actor after a stand-up comedian, etc. And so I'm walking, and the sun is setting, and I'm walking along the Indian Ocean, and I'm looking at the flowers, and I get to this little village. And it's this really, um, you know, uh, this little village with a lot of character. And as I'm walking along the edge of the village, still close to the seaside, I spot a cemetery. And I, I've learned to follow my instinct more than ever before because instinct is more powerful than reason. And life will lead you to an interesting place if you stay with the flow. And so I walked towards the cemetery and I walked into the cemetery and I started walking through the cemetery very respectfully and carefully. But it was interesting to me because a lot of the tombstones were just made out of wood. And <clears throat> somewhat sadly, some of the wooden crosses were actually really, really small. And you could tell that the grave sites were of kids. And as I walked through the cemetery, I saw these crosses and I saw some tombstones. Some looked very old. A few graves looked fresh. And it reminded me really about the shortness of life. I mean, Marcus Aurelius has written one of my favorite books, The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. And actually, he didn't write it. Uh, Marcus Aurelius was a Roman emperor. And during a long military campaign in his journal, he wrote his thoughts and his philosophies. And someone found those diaries, those journals, and made them into this book called The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. And he does talk about the shortness of life. And so does you know, Epictetus and a lot of the great Stoic philosophers. And being in this cemetery and walking through it with great delicacy, it reminded me how short life is. And it reminded me we all have hopes and dreams and we never know when those dreams are gonna get dashed. And you know, we never know when our last day will unfold. Some people will wake up tomorrow morning, they'll get in their car, you know, they'll take a shower, they'll have their coffee, they'll say goodbye to their loved ones and that will be the last day that their loved ones will ever see them. You know, some people on the planet the day after tomorrow will go into their doctor's office to get the result of a routine checkup and the doctor will say, sit down, I've got some sad news for you. And they'll be diagnosed with maybe some kind of a terminal illness. I mean, accidents, illness, tragedy, catastrophe is also a reality of humanity. And so what I'm suggesting to you is do whatever it takes to be in the moment and to stay positive, and to stay on your game, and to optimize your craft, and to spend time with your loved ones, and to take care of your fitness, and to learn something new every day, and to enjoy the beauty of sunsets and star-filled nights, and at the same time, as much as possible. Please, do not lose perspective. Stay connected to your mortality. You know, Steve Jobs in that famous Stanford speech said it really well. You know, you are naked, you have nothing to lose. And he learned that when he connected to his cancer. And so maybe you will install a ritual once a month on the way home from work, you will pull over to a cemetery and you'll spend five minutes even in meditation, looking at the tombstones, looking at the crosses, studying the graves, or whatever your tradition is in whatever nation you're from, because not every tradition I know has the grave site. Sometimes it's the, the funeral pyre, which really reminds me that life is really short and you never know when your last day is going to be. And so just build some kind of a routine to remind you on the shortness of life so that you 
tell the people you love how you feel about them. So you write the letters that need to be written. And I know people don't write letters, but writing a letter to someone you need to express forgiveness to or gratitude to is really powerful. Pursue the projects that will allow you to be the legend of your industry. Chase the passions that fuel your joy and live every day as if it was your last because we never know when our last day will show up. I run what I call the 2020-20 formula. I shared it with yeah, you yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. you know, many people around the world have found great value from it. And it's pretty simple. I mean, it, it sort of rolls back to what the Spartan warriors once said. And they said that the person who sweats more in training bleeds less in war. Right. And whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're an artist, whether you're a baker, whether you're a yoga teacher, whether you're a mom, whether you're a street sweeper, you know, you when you walk out in the world, there's a call on your life to bring your best game to the world and release as much talent as possible. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, what they do is they get up every morning and they sort of run their day by default. Right. And they're chasing the day and they let life act on them in a very reactive way. And so I think what we want to do is see ourselves as, as warriors of some sort where we take from five to six every morning and we prepare ourselves mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And so to give a tactic to your, to your many listeners, it's the 20-20-20 formula. First 20 minutes, as soon as you get up, five to five, 20, intense exercise. And that's gonna do a whole bunch of things. I, you know, a lot of my work is very science-based. And it's gonna create a pharmacy of mastery. So you're gonna release dopamine, which is the, the motivational neurotransmitter. You're gonna reduce cortisol in your brain, which is the fear chemical. You're gonna re release serotonin, which even if you're cranky, you start to feel good. You're gonna release BDNF, which scientists are calling miracle grow for the brain, which actually allows your brain cells to repair from stress. I mean, this is exciting mm -hmm. to me. Yeah, it so is. That, <laughs> right, so that first 20 minutes, you rewire your brain. What else do you do? You jumpstart your metabolic rate. What else do you do? You prepare yourself for resilience against stress, and it just goes on and on. Second part of the 20-20-20 formula, you plan. You pull out a journal, you can do a an imprint of your day, which is very powerful, or you can look at your big five or your, your plan, that releases hope, it releases focus, mm -hmm. right? And because an addiction to distraction is the death of creative production. Totally. Okay? And then the final part of the 2020 formula, learning. I mean, he or she who learns the most wins. What made Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs or an Elon Musk, is they know more than anyone around them. And so I believe that, you know, the more you know, the more you can achieve. Mm -hmm. And there's great value investing as much money as you have into audiobooks or programs like you do at the Genius, you know, the, the 25K conference and the Genius Network or whatever it is. But, you know, every quarter I make sure I get out of my office and I go off to a conference. I invest a lot of money in learning and training and coaching. And that's the 2020 formula. You can be a history maker or you can be liked by everyone around you, you can't be both. I mean, the very nature of living your personal greatness and doing something otherworldly in our world of ours means you're gonna have to think differently from the majority. You're gonna have to install the habits and routines that most people don't do. You're gonna have to live, talk, breathe, walk, work, produce, create in a way that most people who are card-carrying members of the cult of mediocrity just don't buy into. When you look at most people out on the world today, and this is not judging, this is just reporting, but they're addicted to entertainment, they love gossiping, they're negative, they're toxic. Anyone who wants to do anything great, they want to bring them down, they dismiss the game changers, and they're just coasting through life. And so the very nature of you stepping up your game, living your greatest potential, owning your craft, dominating your field, and living a life that's legendary means you're gonna have to leave the 5% and make a decision to live as very few people do. And what does that mean? It means you're gonna be laughed at. It means you're gonna be ridiculed. It means you're going to be misunderstood because leadership is a lonely sport and it means you just might be hated. And so there is great value when people start to hate you because 
If you look at Jay-Z, I mean, I was reading his biography, and he said, you know, I really knew that I was having influence in the popular culture when people started hating me. If you look at a lot of the great authors, when their books go to number one globally, a lot of the amateurs actually start to say, oh, that's garbage, I could put them down. I watched a documentary last night on Steve Aioli, the uh, famous EDM uh, electric dance music DJ who's getting so much traction in the world right now. And he was talking about some of the comments that he sees in the social media. And it was things like garbage and, you know, boring and amateurish music and whatever. Even though he's so skilled. I mean, you, you just watch the documentary called I'll, sl I'll Sleep When I'm Dead. And you just see the skill. And you can just look at any great athlete, and you can look at any great scientist, you can look at any great chef, you can look at any great artist, you can look at any great uh, author, you can look at any great statesman, you can look at any world-class stateswoman. Anyone who has done something at an exceptional level breeds cynics and dismissors. So, the point is simply this, the very nature of doing something that very few people are willing to do means that the majority will laugh at you. Why? Because deep inside, they know they have the opportunity to do something great too. And your example makes them feel guilty. And all I'm suggesting to you with great love and respect is simply this. You do have a choice. You can listen to your haters, you can be one of the haters, you can join the victim herd, you can dismiss people who are doing great things, or you can reach into yourself and ask yourself this fundamental question. What do I want to stand for for the rest of my life? Do I really want to rise to mastery? Do I want to get to the last hour of my last day and know that I took every ounce of the human potential I was blessed with, and through easy times and difficult times, I brought it on, and as a result of my values, my mindsets, my heart set, my habits, my routines, my disciplines, I, was, I owned my game, and I modeled possibility, and I served lots of people, and I built a great lifestyle. And now it's the last hour of my last day, and I'm surrounded by, by my loved ones, and even though people threw stones at me, I took those stones, and rather than being knocked down, I constructed a monument of mastery that stands as my legacy. And if you live like that, you'll be one of the great ones, which is my greatest wish for you. You may have read my book, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. Sometimes I speak about Ferraris because I don't have a Ferrari, but I love the way that Ferrari rolls. And here's what I mean by that. A Ferrari is in many ways mobile art on four tires. A Ferrari in so many ways is a distillation of Enzo Ferrari's philosophy on mastery. A Ferrari in so many ways is a reminder to you and me about what world class stands for. And what I want to really dial into today is this. Did you know that every year, Ferrari only produces 7,000 Ferraris? And the point of wisdom or the powerful idea I want you to really think about and deconstruct in your journal tonight after this mastery session is why go really wide when you can be singularly deep? I'm gonna repeat that again. But a great company and a great performer goes really, really deep on one or two things and that's how you rise to iconic. We live in a world, I call it the cult of superficiality, addicted to distraction, afflicted by interruption. So we take the trinity of our performance assets, our mental focus, our physical energy, and our willpower. Those are the three primary assets of a world-class producer and we diffuse them, we disperse them around thousands of projects, lots of little things. And yet I think of the 7,000 Ferrari philosophy. You know, they are world class in, in terms of producing iconic automobiles, vehicles, but they don't want to be, they, they don't appeal to everyone. They don't produce hundreds of thousands of vehicles. They want to do a few products 
They want to bring out a few things, but do them really, really well. And that's really the craftsman's mindset. That's how craftsmen think or crafts women. It's do a few things, but do them really, really well. You are an artist. My invitation to you is to produce poetry in terms of your work that the world reveals as mastery. You know, and that is really all about bringing rigor to your game. It's not about doing a lot of things, it's about doing one thing well. Because the secret of genius is not complexity, the secret of genius is simplicity. You look at any genius entrepreneur, you look at any genius producer, you look at any genius athlete, they're not doing five sports, they're doing one sport incredibly well and then putting in the training time to be monomaniacally focused so that they can become otherworldly brilliant at their one thing. And I guess what I'm suggesting to you ultimately is this. Think about the 7,000 Ferraris philosophy. And if you are a business builder, let's say you're a startup entrepreneur, let's say you're a Fortune 500 manager, let's say you're a professional athlete because a lot of professional athletes are watching these mastery sessions, let's say you are a mother or father, a yoga teacher or a chef, what are the few things that you could actually do in your work so that you take all of your mental focus, your physical energy, and the willpower that you wake up with every single morning. And you really monomaniacally focus those trinity of performance assets on the few things, the few projects that when consistently iterated and improved every day over time will allow you to reach a place where the world calls you world class. And if you can not only get this idea on the 7,000 Ferraris philosophy, but apply it so it becomes a way of being, you really will own your game. Nothing fails like success. You're successful, maybe it's in your health, maybe it's in your finances, maybe it's in your career, maybe it's in your family life, maybe it's in the way that you show up in the world. Awesome. You're in a really vulnerable place right now. It is one thing to be successful, it is another thing to sustain success over the coming decades. Is that not a powerful idea? I mean, let's go to the entertainment industry. It's very hard to be a one-hit wonder. Let's not knock a one-hit wonder. But it's even harder to become an iconic rock band or hip-hop band. Let's go to the arts. It is very hard to come up with your Sistine Chapel. Got it. It is even harder to become a Michelangelo. So are you playing the short game or are you playing the long game? This is rule number two, you know, or lesson number two that life has taught me. Play the long game. Aim for legendary. Don't just Say, I want to be world class in my dominant pursuit for a little window of time. Say, I want to have the guts and the grit and the acumen and the mindset and the capability and the commitment to create enduring success. And that's why I say nothing fails like success. You look at the restaurant that is hot in your neighborhood right now. They're on the path to obsolescence if they're not really careful. Sure, they went from a little neighborhood shop that made beautiful pasta, that had great service, that had the owner on the floor, shaking your hand, getting to know your name. Then they got written up in the magazines and they, then they got interviewed and then word of mouth spread like wildfire. And what happened? They became arrogant. You see, success can be so toxic. And it happens, it, it is such a pull on every human being. It just plays with your mind. And you literally shift from humility to arrogance. You shift from humility to arrogance, and once the arrogance sets in, in a mindset, it starts to populate every other person on the team, every other person in the culture, every other person in the community. And it is a very short fall from success to irrelevance. So lesson number two is nothing fails like success. As you become more successful, become more humble. As you become more successful, work even harder. As you become more successful, care even more about your product. As you become more successful, learn even more. I invite you, when you are the, the titan of your industry, be sitting in the room with 18 year olds beginning their game. When you are the, the, the icon of your field, be the person who is up, not at five o'clock anymore, let's play at four o'clock, reading, listening to the podcast, writing in your journals, setting your goals, 
focusing on your intentions. As you become more successful, be more humble. As you become more successful, be even more punctual. As you become more successful, become even more passionate. As you become older, become even younger. Yesterday I was walking on the street and I met this man in his 80s. He said, Robin, I finally retired. He's probably close to 90. And he is um, a legendary clothier in the country that I live in and he just retired. And he started his shop, which is now an empire, in 1954. So I don't know what that is, but that is decades and decades and decades and de decades. And he did not want to retire, he just retired, but he is still on fire to do amazing things. Age is just a number, do not let an old person into your body, nothing fails like success. It goes back to, to my dad, you know, and he was very much about humility. I mean, he's 77 right now, and he, he gets up every morning and he goes off uh, to, to his medical practice, and he still sees patients all day. And he, he said, you know, I said, Dad, why are you still doing that at 77? He said, because my patients need me. Wow. And so I think, you know, one of the core values he, w he was so um, brilliant in sharing with me is to be an instrument of service. And I think the moment your ego runs your brain and the ego runs your business and the yeah. ego runs your way of being, then your, your gifts and your talents and your focus and your capabilities are off the creativity and the talents and the service that will make you great in the world. And I think it gets to a very philosophical point, if I may. Yeah. I think it's relevant to any leader, any entrepreneur, any business builder, any game changer. But you know, I mean, <clears throat> There is such an addiction to the shiny toys that the ego sells us, yes. okay? Yeah. And, and society and the matrix and our peers and the world says, if you get a Ferrari, if you, get, if you sell 10 million books, if you have lots of money in the bank, if you have you know, the beautiful partner in the big house, then you're gonna wake up every morning and look in the mirror and you are going to feel full of joy and peace and feel you're fully alive. And you know, I've had most of those in my life um, at a pretty exponential level. I've been very blessed. And not one of those things has provided me with enduring, sustainable happiness and fulfillment. Yeah. And the things that provide me with just deep happiness and deep fulfillment and energize me all come from a position of inner power. And so, you know, at the events you're talking about, I der don't derive much power from all the books I've sold or bestseller. I don't care about that stuff. I really don't, I, I care less about that than ever before. At the end of the day, we are a bunch of people on a little planet in a huge galaxy, and before we know it, we're gonna be a bunch of dust. And th the great billionaires get buried next to the taxi drivers and the pizza makers, right. and we are not that big a deal. Yeah. And I think all that really matters is while we are alive, you know, do your best to use every day as a vehicle to birth your talents into the world, and secondly, if you do that, you're gonna serve the world and raise the world with you mm -hmm. and and that all just comes from inner power I mean that's just deriving your power from the place within you know and that's where you get grace and that's where you get great creativity that's where you get boundless energy because it's not about addicted to what the world thinks of you I was in Johannesburg a little while ago and I went through the the airport mm -hmm. and I, I went into the men's room or washroom or bathroom however you want to call it and so I walked in to the men's room and the first thing I hear is welcome to my office and this was the janitor at the Johannesburg men's room. That's funny. Who, who janitorized, or I'll make up a word, <laughs> cleaned the men's, the toilets like Mozart composed music. Mm -hmm. Now that man has no money. That man probably has very little education. That man is judged by the world as having an unimportant job. Right. And that man is a hero could be a hero to millions of people. Why? Because he actually saw himself as an ambassador to South Africa. And he, he, his passion was, was palpable. And his visceral commitment to doing work at the highest level was like you don't see even from the CEOs. Right. And all I'm saying is even the person in the, the, with the broken heart, the person who's down on their knees, whether they see it or not, they have a choice to rise above their circumstances. And leadership and humanity is a testament to the people who have done it. I mean, you read, read the, you, you look at Mandela, you know, 27 years in imprisonment. When his son died, he wasn't allowed to attend the funeral of his own son. He said that was the, one of the great pains of his own, of his life. And what did he do? 
re the victim looks at something like that, torture, and says, I am broken. And they give up and they, spend the, they close their heart, they close their mind, they close their creativity, and they blame the rest of their life on what happened to them. Mm -hmm. But Mandela, what he chose to do was to use it as an opportunity because actually the things that break your heart, if you choose, can open your heart. Mm -hmm. Adv fear, the world says fear is bad. Fear is only an opportunity for bravery training. And what he did was he used those 27 years of torture to open his, himself mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually to the point where when he was released and became the president of South Africa, he invited his jailers to sit in the front row at his inauguration. And he was asked why, and he said, because if I don't, I'm still gonna, I'd still be in prison. Sure. And that's a long way of saying, but you know, we do make excuses because we are very good at self-deception. Because yeah. if we actually had to face the responsibility of playing with our bigness in the world, we'd have to let go of our addiction to our excuses and, and leave what's safe. Am I making sense? No, totally. Here? No, you, you're totally you'd, making you'd sense. You'd have to leave what's safe. I mean, we are addicted to crisis sometimes. It makes no sense. We are addicted to pain. Mm -hmm. And we'd have to actually leave the pain to go out to the possibility of pleasure and joy and greatness. And believe it or not, that frightens us. Right. So we make these excuses and then we blame people. Oh, Joe or Robin, I don't like the way he looks. I, he, he speaks differently. But subconsciously, as you're suggesting, those are just our protective mechanisms mm -hmm. to, to avoid owning the responsibility of our brilliance. The traits that make you strange are the gifts that make you special. And so I know you're different because you wouldn't be here with me now if you didn't feel you're different. You probably don't fit in with most conversations. I sure don't fit in with most conversations. I don't know a lot about most things that most people talk about because I don't participate in the majority. Right? I don't participate in the news. I don't like to gossip. I, I like to encourage people versus diminish people. I like to be productive versus busy. I like to be creative versus complacent. I like to create value versus take from other people. I like to move into my present and future versus get stuck in the past. I like to be fast versus move too, too, too slow. I like to be a leader versus a victim. I like to believe in possibility versus get stuck in rational thinking because you know the instinct is so much more powerful than intellect. And all I'm suggesting to you is simply this. It's the very things that make you different that make you authentic. And if you don't fit in, I just wanna share with you, I've never fit in. And the very nature of anyone who's living a visionary life, and you are living a visionary life, no matter what you're doing, let's not get trapped in labels. Oh, I'm just a coder. I'm just a receptionist in a, at, a, at, a, in a, at a restaurant or, or in an organization. I'm just uh, a yoga teacher. I'm just a gym manager. I'm just a chef in a restaurant. I'm just a teacher. People always say this when I interact with them on the social media. I'm just an entrepreneur. I'm just a student. No, you're not. I'm just a mom. I'm just a dad. No, you're not just, you're very special. There are no extra people on the planet today. And I just wanna to say to you and validate for you and encourage you, those things that other people might not get, those are your gifts. You might be awkward, awesome. You see the world through a different lens. Steve Wozniak, who was on my stage at the Titan Summit Zurich, the co-founder of Apple, one of the best people I've ever met. He would not have been able to create the Apple platforms and products that he created if he didn't see the world through a different set of eyes. Steve Jobs saw the world through a different set of eyes. Travis Kalanick of Uber saw the world through a different set of eyes. Jeff Bezos of Amazon saw possibility. Let me have an online store that initially sells books. John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa, Rosa Parks, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Beethoven, Michelangelo, who did the Sistine Chapel, and in Florence, David, Jonas Salk, Tesla. We could just go on and on and on and on. These people were misunderstood because the nature of a genius is to not fit in.
One of my brain tattoos that I've become very well known for is, no one will believe in you until you believe in you. And so, good people often become seduced by the chatter of their loudest fears. And what I mean by that is, we come up with a great idea. Let's say it's to start a project that will allow you to lead your field. Let's say it's an idea for a new product that will allow you to grow a new company. Let's say you come up with an idea for a new painting if you are an artist. Let's say it's an idea that will allow you to take your fitness and your wellness and your longevity to a whole new level of wow. And pretty shortly after you come up with the idea, your ego starts screaming. Because we, we are good in our comfort zones, but the moment we start to go blue ocean around our next level of mastery, our fears come up because we're going out into the unknown. It's human. You know, if you were look, to look at the psychobiology of it and you were to study the pure biology of it, there's a term called homeostasis. Human beings are hardwired for a steady state. And that kept us alive. So literally, our heart beats around the same amount, you know, the 72 beats per minute, and our blood pressure is within a small bandwidth, and that allows us to survive. But what happens is when we come up with a new idea and when we see a new opportunity and we start to leave our comfort zones into the zone of the unknown where greatness lives, we get scared. And the true heroes and the true titans and the true masters those people are not fearless. Those are people who have just practiced walking into their fear and living on the razor's edge consistently to the point where they're comfortable amid their discomfort. And that's the great opportunity for you, not to avoid fear, but to be comfortable in the unknown, to be comfortable when you're terrified. And that really is what the great artists, the great entrepreneurs, the great titans, and the great masters are very good on doing. So the first reason good people lose is their faith is not as strong as their fear, or to put it a bit more elegantly, their fears are larger than their faith. And so to be tactical for you, how do you build more faith? Well, you, you, you do what you're frightened to do. And it's a practice. You know, a great athlete practices every morning. And a great producer practices walking into their fears every single day. And what I'm encouraging you to do is every single day do one thing that causes your palms to sweat. Every single day start training your brain to hunt for opportunities to step into that unknown where possibility lives. And if you keep on doing it, you're literally going to build some new neurological hardwiring, a new mental, a new pathway in your brain where you become, it becomes easier. Because as you know so well, all change is hard at first and it's messy in the middle and it's beautiful at the end. I remember being in Soho, New York, and I walked into one of the stores and I bought a coat and I was leaving uh, on an airplane for home later that day and I asked the person who was taking care of me, I said, is it possible, and that's a great respectful way to ask for something, is it possible to get this coat hemmed and adjusted a little bit for me. And, he's, and, and I said, the thing is that I'm leaving later today. And he looked at me and I've never forgotten it because we all have these people in our lives who say one thing or show up in a certain way and they stay with us for the rest of their, our lives. And he said to me these words. He said, it, I'd love to do that for you. I'd love to do that for you. And again, the whole brain tattoo I'm trying to deconstruct here is make your I can larger than your IQ. You know, I remember being in Prague and I asked someone on the other, again, I spent a lot of time in hotels and I said, is it possible to do this? And here was the reply on the other end of the phone. I think it was someone from the front desk or maybe it was room service. And I try to eat as clean as possible. So probably it was a request, could I have olive oil and fresh lemon or lemon as the salad dressing? And here's the reply. Just to really lovingly and respectfully and hopefully fluently and elegantly bring this leadership insight home to you. I said, is this possible? And his reply was, anything is possible. So it's really easy to get seduced and stuck into a mindset of can't. 
You know, someone says, let's start a new business. Someone says, here's a great poetic project that if we release it to the world, will help us own our marketplace. And it sounds very obvious again, but ask yourself this, is your default reply a symptom of a mindset of can't, or do you have a mentality of possibility? When someone says, here, read this book, do you shift into can't or can? When someone says, hey, you know what? I'm amped to run a marathon. Do you go, I can't? Is that your default setting in your neurobiological hardwiring? Or do you go, absolutely, or I'd love to do this? You know, it's really, really important, and that is one of the core distinctions of leadership, isn't it? For the next 90 days, your first 90 minutes at work. Make it focused on your single most important project. I'll repeat that again. For the next 90 days, the first 90 minutes of your workday, focus monomaniacally on your single most valuable project. I call it your game-changing move. So it might be, it might be creating a new piece of code that will revolutionize the marketplace. It might be a new product that when you launch it will fill a need within your industry that no peer is currently providing. I don't know what your game-changing move is, but this is your poetry. This is your magnum opus for the next 90 days. So what most people do is, you know, people who are playing at victimhood, people who are in the 95%, people who are making excuses about ordinary results in their life, a lot of them are not doing the things that would give them legendary results. And what they do is they get to the office and rather than using prime time for A activities, they use their best hours watching dancing cats on whatever it is, whatever the video platform is. They spend their best hours surfing the internet looking at blogs. They spend their best hours playing with notifications, reading notifications, chatting with friends who are not really their friends, but really they're just bored so they're distracting themselves, which is just a form of medication because potential unexpressed turns to pain and they're in a lot of pain and it's subconscious and they haven't done the work to know it. So really they've created these drugs of choice like too much email, too much web surfing, too much chit chatting, too much looking at funny looking videos that make them laugh in the moment, that make them feel happy and give them a short burst of dopamine and maybe a little bit of serotonin, which is the pleasure neurotra uh, neurotransmitter, and that's how they get through their day. And all I'm saying is there is so much distraction available to you out there that if you are not acutely careful, it will dominate your days. What I'm really trying to say is this, a ritual for you to run and dial in and hardwire to the point of automaticity, that's the word the researchers use when a habit becomes your new normal over 66 days, is the 1991 rule. And to give it to you again so you really remember it, for the next 90 days, your first 90 minutes, create a tight bubble of total focus so that no one can distract you. Turn off your devices, put them in a little plastic bag, put some reminders on your door, maybe some post-it notes that this is my tight bubble of total focus for the next 90 minutes. Tell your team, tell your loved ones, maybe get a, put a do not disturb so sign on your door. They'll laugh and explain it to them that for the next 90 days, I will spend 90 minutes away from distraction, away from technology, away from interruptions, focusing on my magnum opus, focusing on the genius project that I wanna bring into the world because I will never mail it in, I will always bring it on, and I'm gonna do this for the next 90 minutes, and I'm gonna optimize it and iterate it every day, and I'm gonna bring my full bandwidth because what makes a genius, they all have one trait in common, they were able to spend extended periods of time in isolation focused monomaniacally on their most valuable project. Clarity is the DNA of mastery. So if you look at the titans of business, the true leaders in finance, these people literally will say, look at my charts. They, if you look at a great military leader, you look at a great athlete, they have such granular, in a world of superficiality, they have shifted to massive granularity so they know in intimate detail exactly what their future timeline will look like. Why? Because clarity breeds and builds and is the DNA of mastery. You want to have 
a very clear vision of what your future is going to look like. And when you know in intimate detail what your future will look like, then you automatically, subconsciously, as well as consciously, can say no to the important, so you say a giant yes to the few things that are most important. You've heard me share this before, Confucius said it so well, per the person who chases two rabbits catches neither. And so what I'm encouraging you to do is this exercise before you go to sleep tonight. Let's make this very tactical. I call it the 100 year timeline on a single page, a single page from where you now are 100 years out into your ideal future. I want you every single milestone on a single line to say, here's where I now am. Here's what's going to happen next week, next month next quarter, next year, three years, five years, 10 years, 25 years, 50 years, 75 years, one year, 100 years, until you have a 100 year timeline. And on the other side of the piece of paper, with crayons, so you tap into your part of the brain responsible for creativity, your right brain. Okay, with crayons, draw out your ideal family life, draw uh, one year away, draw out your business life one year away, draw out your adventure life one year out into the future, draw out your financial life, draw out your material life, literally on a page with crayons so you're not thinking because here's, a, I think, a needle moving insight. World class comes from instinct versus intelligence. You get your best ideas when you get out of your thinking. And just to give you some neuroscience, the seat of reasoning is the prefrontal cortex, but there's a phenomenon I teach in my live events called transient hypofrontality. This is the secret of genius. Geniuses don't get their ideas for Uber, Amazon, the electric bulb, Tesla, Shakespeare, the polio vaccination, SpaceX, Great ideas don't come from the intellects. The, they don't come from the neocortex reasoning and thinking. All great heroes and great inventors and great creators dialed into something deeper. When you get out of your neocortex through solitude and my life structure that I teach called the tight bubble of total focus, and when you get away from distraction and you immerse yourself in deep creativity and creation and you find your laboratory or what I call your Menlo Park, like Edison had his Menlo Park, which was with the wilderness away from the world, what happens? The prefrontal cortex gets silent and it's called transient transient, which means temporary, transient hypo, small, frontality. The neocortex, the seat in your brain of thinking, actually shuts down for a short period of time. This is profound information and will confirm your brain is built for genius. But if you don't do the right things, you're not going to be able to allow the genius to see the light of day. You might have a great mindset, positive thinking, but if you have a, a heart set full of anger, if your emotional life is sad, if you're disappointed from the past, if you haven't done that, the sweat lodges and the journaling and the body work and the affirmations to really open up a heart set, then you can have the mindset of an Elon Musk. You can have the mindset of a Steve Jobs. You can have a mindset of a Kobe but you're gonna sabotage yourself from world class. And to me, this is the great myth of positive thinking. You see a lot of people, they read all the books, they're positive thinkers, they've got the vision boards, nothing changes. Why? Because subconsciously, there's this wounding and a lack of deservability, and it's unconscious. And so they haven't done the work, or you may have not done the work to make the wounds of undeservability and scarcity and the low self-worth. That's why positive thinking alone does not work. This is, to me, a revolutionary insight. And by the way, a lot of the people who teach positive thinking in the past are men. So it's very male mind. And a lot of the people who are pioneers of heart set are women. Heart, empathy, healing. And so self-mastery to me, and this is a pioneering model that I teach 
at Personal Mastery Academy, it's not just mindset. That's only 25% of self-mastery. And as you know, self-mastery is the DNA of outer mastery. You're never going to perform higher than what's going on within. Mindset is only 25%. Heart set, your emotional life, working from confidence and love and service and that sense of internal freedom is only another 25%. So those two are only 50%. There's a third interior empire you want to get to world class, which is health set. Working on your energy, your nutrition, your daily exercise, hacking your longevity, eating the right supplements, getting a massage every two weeks. You know my two massage protocol. Doing your 60-minute nature walk every week so that you're health set is at world class, but that's only 75% of the equation towards self-mastery. You can have a great mindset, great heart set, great health set, but if you haven't worked on your soul set, turning down your ego, you know, you know what disease and what energy depletion is caused by your ego beating you relentlessly about you not being enough and seeing your industry peers succeeding and you feel insecure and irritated and angry and jealous, well, where do you do that work? Within your soul set, the fourth interior empire. And as you do that, you turn down the ego and you open up your humanity and you open up your spiritual life and you become more soulful and then you release work that is artistry versus just to win in the next few months. When you literally give your life over to a mighty mission that is larger than your ego and you literally start to see your work as a ministry for the benefit of humanity. And if you literally, if you're an artist or an entrepreneur or a CEO, a manager, a coder, a doctor, a fighter, f firefighter, but literally, if you saw your work as your poetry and your artistry, and you were on a mighty mission that was larger than even your, your ego and yourself, what would the caliber of your output be? Most leaders, most business people, most entrepreneurs, most human beings have never learned to be masterful communicators. And the very nature of influence and impact, which is the leader's job, is communication. I mean, in school, were you given a communication course? Very few people have been taught that. In your personal relationships, have you read books on communication? Well, that leads to, I mean, in, in an intimate relationship or even just with a friend, it's the little miscommunications that over time stack into loss. In your intimate relationships, it's the little conversations that you could have had in five minutes if you had the tools to communicate and the awareness to speak. So literally, you could release the anger and build understanding and speak out your needs and feel the need to be heard. All those little things, if you had learned how to do that over and, and done it in five minutes with your intimate partner, you might not have lost the relationship. And in your professional life, learning to communicate inspires your teammates. You know, if you look at the great leaders of humanity, the Nelson Mandela's, the Mother Teresa's, the Martin Luther King Jr.'s, the John F. Kennedy's, if you look at the great business builders, Steve Jobs, great example, right? He would be on the stage at the product launch and then that favorite line, one more thing. And that's when he would reveal the latest piece of technology that would create industry dominance when Steve Jobs was at Apple. Well, he was a masterful communicator, and Bud Tribble over at Apple called it his reality distortion field. Steve Jobs was a master salesman. He knew exactly what to say to get people to believe in the impossible, to allow their I can't to be less valuable than their I can't. Let's see another amazing Simon Sonic video. Check it out right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. Simon Sinek is a New York Times best-selling author, motivational speaker, and has one of the most popular TED Talks of all time around starting with why. He went from being a law student without purpose to becoming a millionaire entrepreneur 